July 1964, scientists from Canada, the United States, and Britain collaborated in a massive shock and blast experiment involving the detonation of 500 tons of TNT. This completed a program of trials using a progression of TNT charges. The overall experiment investigated shock and blast phenomena and measured the effects of shock waves on a variety of military targets at varying ranges from ground zero. The location was Suffield Experimental Station, SES, the Prairie Laboratory of Canada's Defence Research Board. This brief film shows some of the preparations necessary for a trial of this magnitude and some of the immediate results. SES is about 28 miles northwest of Medicine Hat in the rolling prairie terrain of Alberta. The blast site was 30 miles from the establishment central laboratory at the southeastern corner of their 1,000 square mile test range. In the autumn of 63 and early the following year, Teams from the U.S. and Britain began concentrating at SES in preparation for the joint experiment. Additional accommodation, tents and trailer units, became necessary as preparations strained the normal resources of the station. Because much of the preparatory work would involve heavy construction and other lengthy operations, initial preparations began in the winter of 1963. Local contractors and labor carried out much of the heavy work within the test area. The unusually mild winter of 63 proved ideal for speeding concrete construction. State personnel were more than relieved when most of the concrete work was completed early the following year. Virtually all the station's facilities were engaged in the preparations. This was particularly true of the engineering and machine shops where most of the unusual and unique equipment was designed and manufactured. Casting the TNT for the charge constituted one of the trial's major requirements. The explosive was cast in its entirety at SES in special molds designed to produce rectangular blocks, approximately 32 and a half pounds. The casting program began about two years prior to detonation. After pouring, the molten TNT was cooled for about five hours. The molds were then opened and each block weighed and inspected for physical flaws before removal to storage magazines. Precisely manufactured, the finished 12 by 12 by 4 inch blocks were smooth and square on each face. The diagram illustrates the technique developed to carry out some of the earth studies and the results expected. The section represents the target area near ground zero. The right hand side showing columns prepared in the undisturbed ground before detonation. And the left hand side showing the theoretical crater section after detonation. The displacement and deformation of the soil are shown by the distortion of the columns. To prepare the columns, holes were drilled across the target area. Those under the charge site were run to a depth of 80 feet. Soil samples were collected to determine the structure and composition of the underlying ground. The holes were then backfilled with a colored mixture of sand, lime and dye, compacted and tamped to the theoretical density of the undisturbed ground. The result was the series of colored columns whose deformation would be measured. In addition to the colored mix, small sample tins of colored materials were also dropped into the holes at regular depths to serve as marker horizons showing vertical displacement. They would also serve to identify material ejected from the crater. Purchasing and administrative communications proved two most important phases of the station's operation because the materials in this trial were supplied from such an unusual variety of tripartite sources. The bigger targets began rolling in from Britain and the USA. One morning, Medicine Hat residents and those living along the CPR line were startled to see flat cars carrying a number of heavy U.S. rockets of the Jupiter and Nike configuration. 
offloaded at the siding near Suffield, all targets and equipment were transported by road to the test site within the SES environs, about 30 miles to the northeast. Many of the military targets, including a minefield, were wholly or partially exposed to assess the direct effects of shock waves. This investigation of mines was a joint Canadian-British Army project. U.S. studies on the effect of shock and blast waves entering cylindrical chambers and tunnels required a scaled-down target, a four-foot diameter steel pipe with side extensions. The main value of the program lay in the use of scale models, and scaling laws were in fact developed from this progression of trials. With relatively inexpensive charges of TNT and without radiation hazard, the model experiments gave accurate values when scaled up to the size of a nuclear event. The performance of reinforced concrete arches was studied by a U.S. team from the Waterways Experimental Station for failure in footings versus crown. A typical problem in scaling work arose here. The waterways people had already carried out similar experiments back home in soil of known composition and density. This had to be reproduced at Suffield in order to correlate the results. Canada's Emergency Measures Organization tested several new fiberglass shelter designs at full size. They were buried at various depths and distances from ground zero in order to experience a range of overpressures. EMO was interested in the total movement and any deformation of the structures during the pressure wave, and the units were fully instrumented to record these. The original consistency of the earth was again restored by tamping. Nearly 60% of all the targets were buried and earth moving was an almost continuous requirement for the emplacement of targets and bunkers. The earth dug from one target excavation was almost invariably used as a mound or barricade elsewhere. Cable laying occupied a good deal of time and material. Hundreds of miles of power and instrumentation wiring were laid throughout the test area. Some cables extended back to recording bunkers, sometimes many miles from ground zero. As individual cables were laid, they were tested for continuity. Recording gauges were installed and tested for accuracy and also for possible interference from other electrical equipment. Many photographic records would be required and to reduce the dust likely to be raised, specific areas were oiled. In some locations, tar macadam was laid. In British experiments, both full and small-scale models of military personnel, complete with equipment, were positioned. As for many other targets, high-speed cameras were surveyed in position to record their movement during the passage of the shock wave. Periodic use of full-scale models in various experiments, especially for figures with a number of variables, served to check the progression for scaling. In addition to the models exposed in free air, Others were installed in vehicles in a variety of positions. One Canadian Army project was to check and evaluate respirators when subjected to shock waves. The respirators were installed at a variety of overpressure levels and were protected from dust and the elements by plastic covers until detonation day. The warm, dry spring and early summer made the prairie a pleasant locale for outdoor operations. Many of the high-speed cameras used were mounted on towers in the open, requiring special precautions against the shock. Others were operated in a bunker. Several similar photographic bunkers were established to cover separate events, and all cameras were operated from a central control post. High-speed photography has become an increasingly important research tool in shock and blast studies. DRB's effort in the program was largely concentrated on the physics of blast and shock waves, and measurement of their rate of travel by photo-optical methods has become a highly specialized technique at SES. Basically, this consists of photographing the shock wave's passage in free air against a prepared backdrop. 
In this experiment, the backdrop comprised a series of 50 by 30 foot sheets of canvas, each painted with a system of black and white stripes. The effective height of the backdrop was extended by means of smoke mortars. When fired a fraction of a second before detonation, these would provide a series of high vertical white trails against which the shock wave could be tracked well above ground. The giant holding frames extended for almost a mile at the rear of the charge. The Canadian Army deployed a company safely in trenches constructed at a distance equivalent to one pound per square inch from ground zero, a maneuver designed to familiarize the troops at first hand with a sensation of blast effects. Six days before detonation, work was started on building the charge. A shelter was erected first to protect the TNT from dust, sunlight, and particularly from electrical discharges in the atmosphere. This building was fitted with wheels to facilitate removal before detonation. Construction of the charge was not unlike the building of the pyramids, a block by block technique. The 32 and a half pound cast blocks of TNT were placed in carefully calculated positions to form a 30,000 block charge, 500 tons of TNT. Preparation of this massive charge for complete and instantaneous detonation was another of DRB's main contributions to the program. During the final preparatory stages, entrance to the test area was controlled by the Canadian Provo Corps. The Corps also carried out the complicated traffic plan for the whole area during the final stages. Meteorology played an important role. It has been found that shock waves entering the atmosphere are subject to reflection and adverse conditions can cause shock wave damage in localities well beyond the target area itself. Precise meteorological conditions were necessary, therefore, to prevent such side effects in the test area and the adjacent community of Medicine Hat. The meteorologists at SES kept accurate records of all air masses, both at remote distances and surrounding the test area. Additional local recordings were also made. The date of the trial was selected 18 months in advance, and it says much for the meteorological work and the stability of prairie weather that it was possible to detonate within one day of the date selected. The morning of July 17th was an early one for all SES personnel and visiting teams. Final preparations had begun in the test area about 2.30 a.m. Among the last-minute preparations necessary were the final connections of gauges and pre-detonation checks in the bunkers. All instrumentation systems were tested. All targets were in place ready for the passage of the shock wave. The backdrop was raised and the camera took a final look at some of the targets, soon to suffer substantial damage from shock effects. The smoke mortars were loaded prior to the final arming of the charge. The charge was armed by a small group of specialists after the overall test site was cleared of all other personnel. An SES scientist inserted the detonator very carefully into the charge. The detonator cable and its leads were pushed gently into the center of the bottom of the TNT hemisphere. Among the distinguished spectators placed safely to watch the trial were visitors from the participating countries and Dr. A. H. Zimmerman, chairman of the Defense Research Board. In three minutes, the equivalent of a kiloton nuclear explosion would take place. The range control officer checked finally to ensure there were no strays in the area. Then he locked himself into the control bunker as the last oral orders were transmitted to the participating teams. An RCAF Neptune aircraft positioned itself for high-altitude photographs directly above ground zero at the instant of detonation. 
In addition, the RCAF participated in the target response program and provided low-level post-shot photographic coverage. One U.S. experiment was designed to record atmospheric conditions immediately after detonation by means of a drone aircraft controlled by radio. The drone began circling the test area with its sampling devices ready to record the debris in the atmosphere caused by detonation. The Honorable Paul Hellyer, Minister of National Defense, takes a last look at the TNT charge before it disappears into a mass of pressurized gas. The bending prairie grass indicated the passage of the shock wave as it rolled toward the spectators. The local inhabitants fled. After detonation, a typical mushroom-shaped cloud arose from ground zero. The faces of observers and SES staff members reflected relief and delight as the fireball and subsequent smoke cloud developed. A number of interesting results could be seen immediately. The crater measured 240 feet in diameter at the original ground level and within a few minutes of detonation, partially filled with water. The shape was as expected, except for a central upthrust, a feature similar to many craters on the moon. This has become a subject of much speculation and interest among scientists, particularly geophysicists. The system of circumferential and radial cracks bears a marked resemblance to the structure of some large natural craters on the Earth's surface, suggesting an impact origin. Immediately after the all-clear, teams entered the test site to recover the targets and to examine the gauges and recording devices. The recording cameras were found intact on their towers, having faithfully recorded all events for future interpretation. Many of the individual targets were moved by the shock wave and suffered varying degrees of damage. Damage to some of the rockets was spectacular. Two of the armored personnel carriers were turned on their sides. Heavy equipment was moved into Ground Zero area to excavate a trench exposing a full cross-section of the crater. The excavation sliced through the edge of the colored columns. and workers took over with hand tools, like archaeologists, to expose the columns for detailed examination. Scientists measured displacement of the columns and related this to earth compression and distortion. The results were found to approximate the predicted figures very closely. Hundreds of other effects were recorded. Many are still being analyzed and studied. The Canadian, U.S. and British agencies participating are continuing to compare notes at tripartite meetings and are considering possible future experiments stemming from this series of large-scale TNT detonations.